It doesn't seem like 20 years since I was able to interview some of the country's great comedy actors and performers uh, for a documentary which I wanted to make at the time about the history of On The Buses and particularly the movies. They made three films here at Elstree Studios. Uh, and it was wonderful because we managed to get uh, Stephen Lewis, who played Blakey here, to Elstree, walking around, the, he even walked around the security area, dressed up as Blakey on the day. We didn't ask him to, he just came along with the uniform, said, would you like me to put it on? I said, fine, please do. Uh, we interviewed the wonderful Anna Karen in the, in the bar, which was, uh, had a different name then, but it was in the bar that had been used, not just by those people in the industry to have a drink at the end of the day, but also in several films, including, uh, I think it was the Man About the House film, uh, and others. Uh, and also uh, Roy Skeggs, who was the Hammer producer. He had his office just on the corner of the building up there. He was a producer for Hammer who uh, originally was the Hammer horror producer and then was invited to, to uh, well, when I say invited, he was actually rather sort of um, arm behind his back to do the comedies. He was basically told, if you don't do the comedies, you're out. So he produced a lot of the Hammer uh, comedies, which were very, very popular at the time. And then we interviewed Reg Varney. We went down to Southwest, down to Devon, where he lived, because uh, he was quite elderly at the time and his wife wasn't well. And he said, look, I can't come to Elstree Morris, but if you want to come down to my home in Biddeford, I'll do an interview. So we went around there. And the two writers, the two Ronalds, two Ronnies, Ronald Wolf and Ronald Chesney, we interviewed at Ronald Wolf's house in Golders Green. But here we did three of the, the big interviews. And it's quite odd standing here because we had Stephen Lewis literally in the security area. We had Stephen Lewis standing uh, against that wall where there were the plaques that were unveiled, uh, two on the buses and other films in 1999. We got Roy Skeggs who had that corner office, first floor up. And I walked Anna Karen through into the bar and then up to where the two new sound stages are. So very happy memories. What you do is you relate the part to something that you know or knew about. And I thought, this guy was somebody who had been a sergeant in the army, and he was able to control the men under him with all that force behind him. He didn't have it now. So he was frustrated. So he was like, oh, 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 I'll get you, butler. I'll get you. I'll have you with this. In the four-week schedule, I was there all the time. Um, the two Ronnies, as we called them, uh, the writers were there on hand to help, and a very good production manager. And we looked after Reg. He had his own caravan on the set all the time, and he relaxed. He had a very busy schedule, but uh, he could relax between shots. And he loved it anyway. I mean, Reg is a good old pro, and he just adored it. Stephen Lewis and Bob Grant had both come from the Joan Littlewood stable, so they could create anything. And I think Stephen was absolutely hysterical because he would be given a line saying, oh no, and that would develop into a series, you know, oh no, 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 but, but, and I mean, it was just extraordinary. He built his part from nothing to more or less the second lead in the show. I've recently revisited the television shows and one of the films, um, and even my 12-year-old son, who prefers perhaps more modern television, he's always on YouTube, has enjoyed watching on the buses the television shows. And I think that's because if you think about them in the time they were made and what was going on in society at the time, rather than comedy of the 21st century, um, they may be a little bit dated, but they're great fun. Uh, they're actually quite harmless, um, lots of innuendo, um, some of it more obvious than other, other, other types of comedy. Uh, and I think they have an affection in, in the public's eye because they think that that's what Britain was like at the time. Probably wasn't, but they have that affection for it. I mean, it was a very popular show. So the television shows were getting between 15 and 20 million viewers a week in the days when there were only three channels, the two BBC channels, one and two, and ITV. And the film versions, and you'd imagine, well, why would people go and pay money to go and see a film if they can see a show on, on, uh, on television? But they stormed it. And the first On The Buses film, made here in 1971, called On The Buses, um, was the highest grossing British film of that year. So they were very, very popular. They had some great comedy character actors in there. 
some of them were already, had already been around. Uh, so people like Reg Varney wasn't new to television, and it was really based around him, his character, Stan Butler, and they got everyone else um, uh, to put it around him. But he'd already been very big in uh, Beggar Thy Neighbour, in uh, the rag trade and so on, so he was well known on British television. And the writers, Ronalds, Wolfe and Chesney, uh, lots of writing, uh, Meet the Wife, as I said, the rag trade and other comedies. So it was a comedy match that was made uh, in, in hysteria heaven, if you like, worked really well. Uh, and they were extraordinarily popular for several years. As you say, over 70 episodes in, what, four years? And three films? That's a, that's a hell of a run. And the first film on the bus that went out uh, made uh, a million in six weeks. That shows you how big it was, just lining up to see the film. And uh, it's a great thrill. You, you, you come out, <laughs> you walk down the road, you see the a cinema then is on the buses, on the queues right down the road. It's a great thrill. It was interesting, the first film, we were lucky again because we found a story which was based on the original thing, where in Nottingham, at that time, they'd started wanting to use women bus drivers. And that's the men went story. on strike. They wouldn't have it. And they did all sorts of things to stop it. And that was the basis of the first film. Well, I first got the idea of wanting to put together a documentary about on the buses and particularly the films that were made here at Elstree back in 1999 when I was involved with a charity event unveiling plaques to some of the films, the comedy films that had been made here in the 70s and that was Man About the House, Are You Being Served and On the Buses and we reunited so many different cast members and Stephen Lewis was here and Anna Karen was here from uh, On the Buses and we had other, other guests here as well. And so it started in my mind just to think a kernel of an idea, wouldn't it be great if... And I got to meet uh, um, Stephen Lewis again on location when I was doing a book on Last of the Summer Wine for the BBC. So we met quite a lot and we spoke about it uh, up, in, uh, up in Yorkshire. And he helped me get in touch with some of the people. And it wasn't really until 2002 that life allowed me to start getting these interviews together. So we, you know, we got Reg, can't do a documentary uh, about on the buses about Reg Varney, how could you? We got Stephen, of course. We got Anna Karen. We got the producer Roy Skeggs, and we got the two writers Ronalds Wolf and Chesney. And then my time on that particular project ran out. Other work came along, so we just had to put it to one side for a bit. Um, but we never got back to it, so we didn't get, unfortunately, to some of those actors who were still alive at the time, like uh, Bob Grant, Michael Robbins, Doris Hare, because the project was, if you if you like, put on hold. And then just life took over and other work took over and it never got made. It looked good, it was a big bus. And me sitting at the wheel and we had a replica of the bus in the studio. And what we used to do to make it look more real, I would drive, we had the back doors open and as so though it was the garage and I used to drive the bus into the studio Yes, Rose needed to learn to like uh, drive the bus, and we got him to drive it. A nice man came in, and he learned within a week. He was fine, and we found that uh, with that capacity, we could stick all the props and the lighting, and everything on the bus, and Reg would drive it to the location. And we'd unload the equipment and put on the passengers. Uh, when I was in the army, I drove uh, uh, big diamond tail lorries. So that bike, where it was, it was when we put us on the skid pan, he put me on the, they put me on the skid pan, there's a, uh, an expert behind you on the floor, and as I was turning around, he pulled this, <laughs> and the bus went, <laughs> oh, oh God, I wonder where I was. <laughs> we were made producers because, again, because they'd never done a comedy film, they allowed us more latitude than writers would normally be given. We were always on the set and we were, asked questions by Roy Skeggs, who himself had not, I think, done many comedies, if any, at that time. And uh, so we were, yeah, we were very lucky and we were surprised that it did so well, obviously, you know. And then we were helped because the Variety Club uh, gave us an award. Or, I think Delphont being involved with it did help a lot, but at the end of the day, it's still word of mouth. It was a funny film. That was it. So in the annals of British comedy, there are two sets of two Ronnies. The first one is Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker, the performers in front of camera. But behind the camera, there were the writers, Ronald Wolfe and Ronald Chesney. 
They wrote most of the On the Buses series and the three films, uh, but they also wrote some other really big hits, The Rag Trade, uh, uh, Beggar Thy Neighbour, uh, Meet the Wife. And Meet the Wife is the only British sitcom that's mentioned in a Beatles song. So they were out there. Um, they wrote some great stuff. They also wrote some terrible stuff. And I had the amazing opportunity to interview them both together at the same time at Ronald Wolfe's house. And it was great because these guys had been working for decades together and they literally started and finished each other's sentences. And it was one of those, one of those relationships where both of them were very happy when they started and very happy when they finished. You don't always get that uh, with, with teams of writers or teams of performers. We were lucky that the first film, based on the television series, was not like the television series at all because we were able to go outside and use the bus things. I always remember the skid pan where Reg is driving the bus and the inspector's got on it too and he skids it right round and the inspector fell off the bus. Well, of course, he couldn't fall off the bus, so we had a stunt man, and when the stunt man fell on the bus, he broke his leg. <laughs> Poor so, but, but you know, rather ironic. But, um, and we used all sorts of things like that, you know, the buses are going along the streets and so on, which we could never have done on the television series. And at the very end, uh, Ronald Wolfe's wife called me over. She said, you know what, Morris, she says, they wrote some wonderful comedy, didn't they? I said, yeah. She said, but they wrote some absolute rubbish too. So, not for me to say. She said, no, Morris, they wrote some absolute rubbish, but it paid for this house. And I think that, that was a kind of recognition that, yes, you get hits, but some of the things in life don't work quite as well. And they knew that. They were prolific in their output, so some of it was going to fail. But they were much loved for On the Buses. I really loved the company of their, I mean, their giving their time that day. We sent in the idea of On the Buses to the BBC, and it was turned down. So we took it to London Weekend Television. Well, we're lucky again. Frank Muir then was at London Weekend Television. And and desperately looking for a hit show. They'd had a disastrous time. Every show they put on, as a new network, every show they put on, as a flop. 20 years later, as you'll know, um, the tape was damaged and had to, it had to be repaired. We didn't even know if we were going to be able to repair it. And through your good uh, offices, we managed to repair this tape. So I hadn't seen it in over 20 years. And it was amazing just to see the content. Thank God we did, because I think it really adds something to hear the story of On The Buses from the people who created it and wrote it. One of the reasons we chose On The Buses as an idea, we wanted to put workplace with home, to have the two together. So you get plots where you have both things. It gives you much more chance with the plots. So we thought this guy who goes from home where he's living with his horrible sister and his brother-in-law who hates him and his mother and he pays for everything then he goes to work and he's lumbered with this inspector who hates him also I hate you butler. If you see a guy about 40 years old as Reg was then in a busman's uniform he's not an inspector he hasn't risen up at all uh, he's living at home you know a lot about him and this was great. You know exactly you know, what he's earning, more or less, you see. Yeah. It puts him in a certain class. A uniform is a very good thing to have on a, on a show. So it was great that Hammer Films were still based at Elstree Studios uh, in the early 2000s. And Roy Skeggs, the producer who'd been around for decades, his office, if I remember rightly, I think it was the first office on the corner here, uh, on the John Maxwell building, which is where we did his interview. Uh, Roy used to take his shoes off and historically would like to have a rest, sometimes on the floor. I think he may have had a back issue at the time, um, but he was great. And um, we managed to tease all sorts of interesting information and stories out of him, because he's not someone who really wanted to appear in front of a camera. Um, but he spoke with honesty and affection uh, by the time we got to the end of the interview about working on not just Hammer Horror, but specifically on comedy and the On the Buses films, and it was a really good interview. Everything was very straightforward. We had um, several special effects sequences, a bit of wonderful special effects man, Des I remember a uh, sequence where the inspection pit was filled with foam as a fire, which Rich had to put out, and he used foam, and the pit was full of foam, and Reg has to fall in the foam. We had a stunt man to do the stunts, actually. Then we lifted Reg in, and Reg crawled out. And then uh, the brother-in-law goes into the firm on his motorcycle, same stump man, and he was quite badly injured. He had his elbow and one of his arms were very badly injured. Um, otherwise, it went quite smoothly. We had a sequence uh, where we blew up the toilet on the holiday camp. 
where again we had injuries to stop man, but all the cast were, were fine. I've interviewed many people over the years and uh, on occasions, you know, you send a car and you pick them up and they come and they drop them off and you welcome them to wherever it is you're interviewing or you go over to their home. In this case, it was kind of a mixture of both. Anna said, no, don't send a car for me. She said, come and pick me up. I said, come and pick me up. She said, yes, come and get me. So I drove over to Ilford on a Saturday. It was quiet around the North Circular, brought her back here. Again, filming on a Saturday, so it was quiet in the studios. Uh, and we decided to do the interview in the bar. Uh, this, not just a bar that would be used by the cast and crew, but actually it was a bar that appeared in a couple of films. Um, I think one of them was Man About the House. Um, and she was wonderful. I, I heard the news by Ronnie Chesney ringing me up and saying, we're making a film, there's no money in it. Uh, I always remember that. It was the first thing he said. We're making a film, it's got no budget. The budget for the cast is 7500 so don't be stoppy about it. And that's all I remember. And then the film, and it was great. And we came and shot over here, and uh, the big screen suited me even more than telly, which I was lucky about. We had a lot of fun here. This, this actual bar we're sitting is, in is where we used to come in and have drinks afterwards. She was a bundle of joy, and she really enjoyed that making on the buses and exuded from her her enjoyment of the, of the actual program. Very often people say, oh, I got typecast in something and I don't like doing it or I don't want to talk about it. But she had nothing but praise for it. And what was particularly lovely was that she was very glamorous and she looked great. And of course, the character doesn't. Um, and it was wonderful to see the real Anna Karen. But it was one of the happiest interviews uh, I've ever done. She was in such good spirits. It was a lovely day. And then we walked around after we did the interview uh, we walked around the studios and I showed her various parts of, of, of what was then L Street as it was trying to make its way back up to being a, a, a fully-fledged studios again after what had been a very difficult time for the site in the 90s. It said that she was always ill and that she was sex mad. And I sort of put the two together and thought, well, if she's sex mad and she's not getting any, there must be a reason. So I decided to make her as ugly as possible. And the, the wig I had actually had a sort of a flat top, so that it flattened my head, a bit sort of pre the monster sort of set up, really. And it was like that. It really was a killer of a wig. I've still got one at home. And then, of course, I dressed her in those outrageous things. I, with that, I would wear those silly frilly nighties that very slim dolly birds would wear, which made her so even more incongruous. So I was walking around the studios with Anna Karen. Uh, we came past the George Lucas stages. They had been opened in 1999, and this was 2002. So this was a major development for the studios. But where the two brand new platinum stages now are that have only just opened was the old water tank. And nothing had been on the old water tank. And a little known show at the time called Big Brother which had done two seasons down in three mills, needed a venue to build a new house. And they wanted it within a studio surrounding because it was easier than being outside. And when I brought Anna over, it was just as they were building and putting down the foundations for the Big Brother house, which became mushroomed into a huge show and then ran not just for the two years at three mills, but 16 years here it ran. Um, so that was 20 years ago, 2002. Um, so it was fascinating being able to show Anna um, the development of the site, but that really was a change. And now Big Brother left a few years ago, and we now have two new, brand new state-of-the-art sound stages. So L Street continues, but that's where we were 20 years ago when there was hardly anything there. Well, I, I think Blakey was a character who was uh, a bloke who had been very successful in what he ever did. And he also was a guy who didn't want to be just bullying them. He wanted to run a proper service for the public. And these people were taking liberties all the time. There were people waiting at bus stops who needed to get to work, and do things like that. And they were mucking about and stopping that from happening. So I was seeing that they did their job properly, you know, that, that sort of guy. And it, as I say, when I was in the army, in, the, in, the, in my mind, I was able to really get them going, but I couldn't, I didn't have that same authority now, so it was just frustration all the time. 
Oh, slow down a little bit now. I'll get to you. I'll get you. Oh, I love you. So here we are outside stage seven, where The Saint was filmed in the 1960s. And behind stages seven, eight and nine, as well as there being dressing rooms and offices, there's also the preview theater where the daily rushes used to be watched on films like Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And it was in the preview theater um, that I interviewed Stephen Lewis, Blakey, uh, talking to him about making the Three on the Buses films here at Elstree Studios. One mate said to me, they're doing auditions, he said, uh, next Thursday. So I said, you're joking. So he said, no, he said, why didn't you go and do this? I said, oh, come on. He said, I tell you, he said, do, do an audition. He said, well, I'll come and watch you. So, all right then, I'll do it. So I learned a couple of little pieces and uh, I went in there and they said, right, next. And I went and did my little piece and they said, and a voice said, right, thank you, that's it, thank you. And I thought, oh, well, that's it then. So I walked out and I saw my mate in the bar and we were standing there talking. So he said, what do you think? I said, ah, well, that's it. And suddenly she was alongside of me and she said, um, so will you be available in September for that? I said, what? She said, will you be available for that? I think it was a piece called You Won't Always Be On Top. And uh, I said, yes, I will, you know. And I came and did it and that's it. I was in the business. So Stephen Lewis, uh, who plays Blakey, came to the studios. He said, don't worry, Morris, don't send a car, I'll come on the train. And he came on the train and he turns up and he's got a bag in his hand. And I said, what have you brought with you? You know, sandwiches, ha, ha, ha. He says, no, I've got Blakey's uniform here. He said, I don't know if you want me to wear it at all. I said, well, we won't wear it for the interview. I said, but perhaps we can do some stuff afterwards. So we did the interview in the preview theatre. And then he said, give me a few minutes. And he put this, this, this uniform on and he did his moustache and everything. And he started doing Blakey and he came down and he came here into the security, uh, the security area. He started people to the security people um, and he was completely in character. It was absolutely wonderful. And where we'd put the plaques up in 1999, which was on this wall here, he then starts talking to me because we had an idea maybe he could do a link to, in to introduce each film uh, if we were to put them out as a box set. So he was doing that as well. I'd like to introduce this programme about on the buses. I'd like to, but I hate to. <laughs> I'm happy when I hate to. <laughs> they wanted to get that big twit, that Stephen Lewis, to play this part, but they decided that he was far too ugly. So they got me instead. <laughs> so I, it's all about on the buses. And no laughter, please. No laughter. I hate laughter. I like to spread misery and gloom. If I can spread misery and gloom, it makes me happy instead, see? <laughs> right, and no laughter. No laughter, mate. I'll have you. I'll have you. I'll have you. And then he just really got into it, and he was walking around the studios as people coming past, going, oh, my God, I hate you, and all that kind of stuff. And he finished off by going into the, uh, the coffee shop area here. Um, and he was just... Loving it, but everyone remembered him. This was 2002, like almost 30 years after the show. Everyone loved it, and he just played the part so well. Um, and it was great fun. It was totally unexpected. Hi, sir. Can I have you? Yes, I've uh, come to work on a programme about on the buses. Okay, can I take your name, then, please, sir? You, you don't know who I am? No, sorry, sir. Just your name, please. <laughs> you for you. Inspector Blake. Sorry, sir. I'll just have a look for you. You, you, you don't know? We've got a Stephen Lewis. Stephen I? Lewis? What that ugly twit? Go up, inspect it up. Oh, get out of it. Oh, God. I'll get you. So I was in touch with uh, Stephen Lewis, and he came and did the interview here, and he gave me a contact address for Reg Varney. And I wrote to him and said, Reg, look, would you like to come up to Elstree and do this interview? We'd love to have you here. I kind of knew what the answer was going to be because when we did the charity event, the unveiling of the plaques a few years earlier, he said, I can't make that trip there and back because my wife is getting older now and he's not in the best of health. And I got a similar letter back, but his agent said he would be very happy if you want to go down and interview him at his home. Absolutely, you know, absolutely why not? So we drove down to uh, Devon, stayed overnight because it was a long old drive. Um, and it was lovely. 
Um, when we knocked on the door, the door opened and, it, well, it was 88 by that stage. And it was like an elderly man opening the door, you know, and I thought, oh, I'm not sure how this interview is going to go. They finally found a slot they could put me in. Situation comedy thing. And that's how it started. I went from one rag trade, went on for quite a few episodes. And I uh, went into a beg of my neighbour. And when we finally, finally got round to uh, on the buses, which was, um, of all, uh, a sensational success. And not only, not only here, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, funnily enough, on the west coast of America, they loved it uh, there. And as we started to do the interview, and as he started to reminisce and look back, literally the years dropped off him. He became more animated, smiling, laughing, and at the very end and unannounced, he just turned around and started playing the piano because he'd grown up with all these skills, these clowning skills, not just acting skills from when he was back in the halls when he was a kid. And he just started playing the piano. And it was the most wonderful couple of hours. Uh, he really was, he had, he wasn't arrogant in any way, shape or form. Uh, and he was very grateful for the parts that he'd had and he had a good life out of it. And he recognised that. Um, and it seemed a fitting interview to have. I was really glad we got it. Stan, he, uh, he was somebody that everybody wanted to be. You know, he, uh, uh, they, and also they, uh, they laughed with me. And if things were going against me, they would feel sorry for me. It was one, and yet I never played for that at all. But if, uh, you know, and uh, Stephen Lewis was a, also, uh, but all of them, uh, but Stephen was a great foil for, for me, you know. And uh, of course, uh, Bob Grant played my conductor. And uh, he was one of those, you know, uh, walking out with the birds, you know. And uh, it was an enjoyable show. We, we, we believed, this is the thing, we believed the character we, we was playing. And uh, that, that's what made it a big success. Yeah. And it was enjoyable to do as well. It was enjoyable to go to work, let's put it that way. It's been wonderful We're looking back at all these interviews. Um, the shows and the films were made over 50 years ago. The interviews, almost 25 years ago. And they say, never meet your heroes, it always goes wrong. Well, I met some great comedy heroes. I met Reg Varney and Anna Karen and Stephen Lewis, and they were great. They couldn't have been nicer. And that's because they had a huge affection for the program. And yeah, of course, if you look at it now, with 21st century goggles on, you know it couldn't be made today, but you need to look at it with 70s goggles on, what was going on in the country at the time and how television was broadcast and what productions were made and in what way. And if you do that, you can still have a laugh and you can still enjoy it, knowing that it's part of a, almost a time capsule of British comedy that wouldn't be repeated from you, but the old episodes can be shown, the old films can be shown. And for that reason and for the great memories I have of looking back over 20 years ago on some interviews which were just in a box for all that time. Um, yeah, I'm feeling really good about it. I really enjoy it and I hope other people enjoy it in the same way. Well, when I first started, I always thought that all you had to do was a, a sing-along or uh, something like that. And uh, I always, the very first sing-along, I think, yes, it was, I ever did was... Um,
Stay safe.